start off by thanking Suzanne and Brad for this incredible conference. I think this is my fifth time coming, and every year it's just um, it's flawless execution, amazing content, and we're just so grateful that you do this. Um, so let me just start off with explaining a little bit about how Google Threat Intelligence operates. What our mission is to protect Google users and customers, and when I say Google, I mean the entire Alphabet ecosystem. And when I say users, I mean billions with a B. Uh, I think when the Mandiant acquisition happened, I came over with Mandiant, uh, that was probably the first thing that we thought about that was different was truly the scale at which uh, Google has visibility into threats. And we do this to create a common operating picture, a comprehensive threat picture that we can use to disrupt adversaries. So, one threat in particular that we have been focusing on is threats using AI and threats to AI. The uh, rapid adoption of AI in industry is something that I think many of us have never seen. Maybe, maybe with the internet, the onset of the internet can, is coming close, but this AI generational reset moment is something that threat actors are starting to pay a lot of attention to. So what are they doing? Um, they're using AI, obviously, to do better social engineering. You know, yes, the spear phishing emails are, are written better. The, the pictures and the fake images that are being created are a little bit more sophisticated. Um, they're using AI to help them do what's called vibe coding. So they can do a lot of natural language coding uh, because they just say what they want to do and the AI will create the code for them. So that barrier to entry is lower. Um, we're also seeing two things um, that, that are, are, are very surprising to us uh, from, uh, from how rapidly it's been coming through, and that's uh, the automated intrusion activity and also the AI-powered vulnerability research. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. And finally, um, AI-powered malware. This is something that we have been looking for and being asked about for years, and we saw it in the wild for the first time. I'm not saying somebody doing research in a lab, I'm saying that we saw AI-powered malware being used by the Russians, and I'll talk to you more uh, about that. So just social engineering in general, we've seen this for many years, and we've seen you know, this used by cyber means, but it's not just the images and the deep fakes and all that, it's also the, the voices that can be created. So we're seeing how individuals are being tricked into doing all kinds of things, including a finance worker paying out $25 million after he had a video call with a deep fake CFO. Um, now, what's interesting is that uh, this is something that we have actually red teamed using our Mandiant folks, and it is very, very effective. Um, so what are going to be the business processes that are going to need to be put into place and what are those approvals that need to happen if you could be in a video call with somebody and not know that you're talking to an AI-generated form? So that's how sophisticated this is getting at this point. Um, we also track threat actor use of Gemini. That's Google's AI um, large language model. And we have watched them um, use it all across the world. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're seeing. Uh, in, in uh, the usage of, of Gemini by, we'll call it the big four first. When we look at uh, Iran, for example, they kind of try to be a power user of Gemini for some reason. I don't know, and I've always thought I would love to ask them what features they like because we could really maybe get better at what we're doing. But um, we've watched them do things with AI to create content. So they really like to localize into English or Hebrew. We've watched them do a lot of research into military platforms. Um, there, there's a lot of interest of threat actors in anti-drone technology, F-35. So in some ways they're using it a little bit like search, but then also for coding and scripting tasks. We've watched China-based threat actors and APT groups actually use AI to do uh, vulnerability research. And they've even tried to reverse a very uh, popular EDR tool that's used very broadly. Um, so when we're looking at this type of thing, what is really clear to us is that our, our adversaries are using tools, or trying to use the tools as much as they can to increase the, along the entire uh, attack life cycle. So understanding the target, doing the research, um, and trying to develop and weaponize uh, malware, for example. 
They're also doing this to enable post-compromise activities. We watched a China-based threat actor actually try to use Gemini in order to assist them in their next steps of an intrusion. So the way this works is, if you're hacking into a network and you get to a certain point where you're not, you're sort of at a juncture that requires a decision to do something or, or you need some technical advice, and they would use the LLM to actually make suggestions about what the next step should be. We watch North Korean threat actors use AI to generate false documents. And if you haven't heard, there is a real problem right now with North Korean IT workers and getting themselves hired at Fortune 500 companies. And I know what you're thinking is that how in the world could that possibly happen? And is North Korea even sophisticated enough to be able to pull something like that off? I'm here to tell you they're doing very, very well. And they are getting themselves hired in uh, across the Fortune 500. Now, the FBI has done a wonderful job of rounding up a lot of them that are in the United States and sort of the, the intermediaries that are knowingly or unknowingly, you know, sponsoring laptop farms for their use. But now they're moving to the rest of the world. So we have seen this uh, operation across Europe and Asia. And actually in Europe, we watched one North Korean IT worker who was uh, actually had nine different personas and was recommending themselves to each other and doing that type of work. So this is, this is getting to the point. Some people say, well, they're raising money. Yes, it's going to their nuclear program. And that is terrible. But the other part of the plot we shouldn't miss is that we now have North Koreans you know, embedded in hundreds, maybe thousands of companies across the world and that's a very effective way to preposition in the event of some type of conflict. They have privileged access. In some cases, they're given full employee access. And they get away with it because of the forged documents, the AI-empowered images that they can create. They can do these interviews, or they hire people to do the interviews for them. And it's working. So I told you that there was uh, AI-powered malware. We saw it in the wild. So. The Russian military actually was using it in Ukraine. And basically the way it works is um, this malware actually calls out via API to a Chinese uh, large language model. And then from there it issues commands. So the, the, the takeaway here is that it's really going to frustrate that static malware analysis capability if threat actors can you know, generate commands on the fly. It makes it much more complex. Um, now, I don't want to alarm people too much because, yes, we're seeing this. It's just starting. Um, but what's interesting is uh, we haven't seen it move through the entire life cycle to the point where there's a major change in the incident response work that we're seeing. So what I mean by that is we would assume at some point that, that threat actors using AI are going to get so good at it that they're going to cause more intrusions uh, more sophisticated intrusions, and that companies across the world are going to start to raise the alarm to say, hey, we're up against something that's different. That hasn't happened yet. So we haven't seen you know, a surge in incident response work. We haven't seen um, any real difference in, in the way that companies and organizations and governments need to actually defend against this. So this is still about making sure that you've patched your vulnerabilities. It's still about not clicking on things. It's still about the basics at this point. What we anticipate, though, and I think I said in, in uh, the panel on, on Monday was, uh, or Sunday, rather, was that I really do believe we're in the before times, though. Because as this technology gets better, we're going to see more sophisticated uses and that automated uh, vulnerability scanning and all that uh, type of identification that can be done um, at scale can really create something that is different in the threat landscape than we've ever seen before. So let's switch to the good news. What are we doing about it? Well, we're doing quite a bit. Um, my team in particular is now working very closely with Google's DeepMind. We're you know, looking at threats that we can see from our vantage point, and we're making a lot of progress in trying to understand what threat actors are doing. Um, you know, the landscape is pretty interesting right now because uh, it's not just about state versus state. There is tremendous competition 
between all kinds of organizations. And you maybe have heard of some very exciting new technologies, cheap uh, you know, LLMs and these AI models that are coming out that create a real advantage for threat actors. In fact, we also had, um, in, in, our, in our group, we monitor the underground or the, the dark web mo you know, marketplaces where threat actors are buying and selling things. And what we saw was a lot of tools being sold to try to bypass guardrails. So Gemini, for example, their guardrails kicked in and really kept threat actors from doing anything serious or anything new and novel. But when threat actors have access to these underground tools being sold, they're going to get the power of LLMs, even if they're you know, full of security holes, but they're gonna be able to do things that um, you know, the normal um, you know, um, AI models that are sold from you know, companies that actually are putting security features in there to stop that, they're gonna be able to use that to do the types of things that we're talking about. So that's basically what we see on the horizon. So what do we do about it? It really is about using AI to battle AI. Um, it starts, kind of feels like a movie, but it's not. Um, so what we're using uh, AI for is we're using it um, in an implementation called Big Sleep. And Big Sleep is something that uh, Google's DeepMind and Project Zero have worked together on, and it is a way for AI to scan for vulnerabilities proactively. In November last year, we found our first vulnerability, and that was very exciting that um, you know, we wouldn't have found otherwise, most likely, at least not in any, any reasonable amount of time. Skip forward a few months, we actually were able to use AI uh, in order to thwart something that a threat actor was trying to do. So what we saw in the underground, we had a few different artifacts, but we saw that there was a zero day in open source software called SQLite. And we did not know what the vulnerability was, but we knew a threat actor was planning on using it. So we worked with our teams at Google and we implemented the Big Sleep LLM to try and analyze uh, the source code and found the vulnerability. So we were able to reach out to SQLite and help them get it patched before the threat actor could even move on it. That is the type of AI defense and, and, and really incredible capabilities that are going to make a difference in the cyber threat landscape. Uh, and we have a lot of other uh, exciting things going on as well um, that are going to help us in this new and different uh, generational AI reset moment. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanted to end on one note, and that is for all my cybersecurity brethren in the room, we have talked a lot in the past decade about info sharing and intel sharing. And I've, I believe that looking at the statistics and looking at the rise of ransomware, the rise of espionage, and what we're going to be up against with the AI threat landscape in the future, it's going to be really critical that we move beyond intel sharing as if that's the goal. That cannot be the goal. We're not going to get anywhere. We haven't gotten anywhere using those, uh, that mentality from before. So I, just repeating what I said Sunday night is that Google has now a disruption unit. We look for partners to help us find opportunities to actually do takedowns and disrupt threat actor activity proactively. Um, we do this in legal and ethical ways. We're doing it now with partners. And I believe that this is what industry should be doing already. And it will make a difference if we work together and do this at scale. So I'm very excited about this, but we cannot make Intel sharing the goal. The goal has to be disruption. Intelligence is for decision makers to do something. It's not just to be the smartest people in the room about threats. So with that, if you have any ideas or if you would like to collaborate, uh, we're already collaborating with many in the room actually. If you see an opportunity where you think a takedown is, is, makes sense, we would love to hear from you. And let's, uh, let's start uh, a new effort and a new refreshed effort to do more to take down all these threats that we're seeing.